Perfect. Who better than Derek, Pat, Andrew, the wrestling crew? Man, they bout to put an end to y'all careers like a finishing move. They bout to give y'all facts on these cats that's fighting on these mats. Y'all can't see them like John Cena. Even if y'all had 2020 vision, y'all better listen. Pay attention and take notes down and realize that it's not your time now. And watch these three kings take the crown. Hey, hey. Hey, this is Colin West here with the best light heavyweight on the planet today, Arcadia. I'm thinking about changing to heavyweight. Really? Mm-hmm. You, know, you, you really want to put on that kind of weight? Nope. What are yeah. we listening to? We're listening to Wrestling IQ 101, the best podcast on the internet today. A number one. A number one. You really want to put on that kind of weight? Mm-hmm. Wow. Hey, guys. I'm Andrew, alongside Pat and Derek. You. Yep. And we are Wrestling IQ 101. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at WrestlingIQ101. And today we're sitting with the unbreakable Rob Fury. How's it going, man? I feel phenomenal, and it's great to be here in this secret location. <laughs> secret <laughs> Amongst the greatest <laughs> podcast in the universe. Thank you for having me. Well, thank really you for that. that. <laughs> I like that. In the universe. I like that. I like that. That's good. Yeah. So, um, Rob, let's see. We're going to go back. Tell us. Long way. 1996. How you guys started in the business? You got a lot of notes over there. <laughs> <laughs> I got started in the business because I wanted to pick up water. Oh, man. <laughs> nice. I wanted to pick up girls. You know, I think you could be a rock star or a wrestler. I couldn't say. I was a halfway decent basic wrestler. So I was like, all right. So uh, what I did was I, I, I did the smart thing and dropped out of high school. Mm-hmm. And decided to choose this path to become a pro wrestler. I was lucky, and uh, I think it was uh, timing, because at the time there was a pro wrestler that did some enhancer work for WWF at the time, and ECW, Chris Michaels, and uh, he was coming off a knee injury, he pretty much needed a tackling dumpy, and uh, he went down to Gleason's gym, and first day in, I I said to him, uh, I'll never forget this, I said, so how fake is this stuff? And, and years later, every time I moved my neck to the left, it popped from that pile driver that he gave me. Oh, oh man. How it wasn't. So I uh, I broke into the business uh 96 through him and through people like Magic and Biggie Biggs and uh, Pipple Gary Wolf from ECW. And those guys were the guys that led me along. Nice. At a very young age, I was 17, I think. Nice. So uh, moving towards today, you're a... Uh, Always talking about the power of Ichiban. So I want to know just a little bit more about that. The power of Ichiban, you know, it, it, it's, well, there's two things. I mean, I know Ichiban, you know, it means number one. Hogan used it many, many years ago in Japan. Still didn't, I think his last thing he did there was 03. And even when the WWE did it in 2013 with him. But I feel like now I've kind of turned it into my, my whole gimmick, my whole creation is a throwback to what wrestling was. And, uh, the power of Ichiban to me is really the law of attraction. Just put good energy out in the universe and, you know, believing you're number one and going out and doing the best you can do and being the best you can be. So when I say, uh, you know, Ichiban number one, Rob Fury, the whole deal, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a throwback to the past, but I love it, man. And I, I think you really live that too. Like on your social media, you're always putting out these positive quotes and you know, you never let any of your, your haters get to you or anything. You always got these positive videos, positive, you know, quotes going out there too. So I think you're, you're living the, the gimmick too. I think if you, if you want to be it, you have to be it. It's a 24 seven. I mean, I, I was taught that. I mean, you, you, you in the business and in life, I feel like it's one and the same. If, you, if you're going to be all in, you got to be all in. So, I mean, it's hard at times in life beats you up. It, it, it's life. You know? it doesn't have anyone happy ending. But what I do is I try to just get out there and, and, and you put positive stuff out there. So, and then I just, I was watching something from years back with, with the Hogan interview in Japan. I went, man, no one's doing that anymore. You know, bring it back and do this now. And, so we'll see if it works. I mean, it might not. But, but the power of the law of attraction, that kind of stuff, I live by it, man. It's faith. It's just believing in higher power. Keep it going. 
So the five guys, they removed you from power before, and you brought in a good friend, Mr. Unbreakable. Did Mr. America from WWE inspire that angle? Who told you about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you know that was me? <laughs> All right, well, here's the, the shoot truth. If that was you. <laughs> yeah. Here's the shoot truth behind that. So <clears throat> we do uh, the Mega Slam show. I was hurt. I was out of shape. I wasn't. I uh, took 55 pounds off our bag of chips since that. We did the, the first Mega Slam show in Jackson, New Jersey. Yeah. Sold out standard of only. And I was getting ready at that point to say, okay, I'm going to take a little time off to heal. And the idea was, you know, five guys would, would fire Rob Fury and I'd heal, heal up and put a mask on and be Mr. Un- Mr. Unbreakable, which was them from the Mr. America yeah. angle, which I, I loved it. Everybody, you know, would look back at it. But I hated the mask. Oh. That's what it was. So, like, it was supposed to go for about six, seven months of just peeling up my back to come back into another run. But no, like, I put the mask on, I think two shows, and I'm like, I can't see. I'm itchy. I can't <laughs> Man. breathe. This sucks. My contacts, you know, and I'm just, I'm, I'm complaining to everybody. <laughs> then I finally get, I, I ordered the mask. It took like seven weeks to get here. So, when the real mask got here, I actually have him. I sent a picture of it to you. It actually is the Mr. America mask with the oh, red yeah? star. It's just red with a white star. I never wore it at a show because by the time that happened, I killed the whole gimmick. <laughs> oh. I, back. I came back. <laughs> but yes, it was a complete rip off and 100%. So was Hogan your all time favorite growing up? Oh, one of them. I think uh, he, that was the biggest inspiration. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I turned on, geez, man, I was seven years old. The first thing I ever saw was, uh, what was that angle years ago when one golf closed like Hogan? Oh, and that's and it was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I was drawn in, man. It was you know, then they broke his ribs on Saturday night's main event with Bundy. Yeah, and yeah. you know, I was like, you know, then like all these years later, I got, I got Tommy the Boost that was four hundred pounds with like Bundy, and I'm like, this is great. Like, <laughs> this is my whole childhood come to life. But, so yeah, it was um. Totally a big inspiration. Anything from that era, like the eighties, yeah. and, and I love like when you know, they take all the shit on the internet. And they're like, "Fury's outdated and he's delusional." They don't understand. The whole gimmick is a throwback. Yeah. It's supposed to be that way. Yeah. But yeah, that is. Were you true. devastated when Hogan turned? I I was surprised. Yeah. But I think it, looking back, he changed the industry. Yeah. What he did, what, yeah. what they did, you know, it was yeah, it was, it was probably the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. He did that. He revitalized his entire career. Definitely. Now, running a um, an independent company, uh, it's not an easy task. I could, I would guess. Um, what would you say is probably like the hardest part of like day to day operations? That's a good one, man. You guys got a lot of notes. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, day to day operations, it's it's like the flip coin. You know, it's. A lot of, and I hate the word promoter, I like to say, you know, producer of pro wrestling events, you do that, but being a wrestler for, I've been in the business 22 years, so being a wrestler, you know, minus six years of that, you know, I worked for all different promoters, so I learned the good and the bad, worked for the real good ones, real bad ones. The hardest part of the of day-to-day operations is trying to keep a team together, because a lot of that team is spread out everywhere. And uh, I think the hardest thing is also finding the niche market of what the fan base really wants to see. Keeping in touch with the fan base, you know, uh, dodging the bullshit on social media, you know, and and keeping your head above water. But it's, uh, I think the biggest challenge, if I had to put it on on the uh, tier of things at the top, is, uh, you know, picking your area you're going to run. And uh, just staying consistent. Yeah. That's the biggest challenge is always, you know, you're, you're always going to deliver whether there's eight people, 500 people, 1,000 people, 5,000 people. You're always going to make sure the guy's always going to deliver. I'll always deliver. But the biggest challenge is just running everything because yeah. it really is. I mean, I have a great vice president, William Fesky. He works very hard with me. We have a really good creative team that works with me. Um, some of them have been in your podcast who help me with creative stuff. And, um but that that's really it. It's just like everything. You know, it's it's writing, it's creative, it's booking buildings, insurances, flying talent in, dealing with agents, you know, 
every building's yeah. you know. And kind of like on the uh, flip side, I guess I would say, what like advice would you give to someone that wants to start their own independent company? Don't. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, it's, uh, well, well, the way it was, I mean, I left the business for a little bit. I had back surgery, and uh, when I came back in, you know, I had uh, went into managing banks and doing business management with that stuff. So I realized that you know, every business takes three years to kind of turn over. So we'll be going into our sixth year in January, which is kind of it feels like it was yesterday doing the first show. But uh, I think the advice really would be plan it out yeah. because when I when I started it, there was no plan. It was just like, all right, well, I came back and I had back surgery and I'm working for any companies that I didn't like. And, I just want to do my own thing. And I had no plan. Yeah. You have to really plan it out. And that's, you know, and it's being organized, which I'm still working on. Yeah. yeah being and, organized is a big part of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of the guys will tell you, like, they're either going to say Rob's really, I'll look organized, but it's, it's all at work. Yeah. I'll, it'll look like I'm coming with the file. Here's the run sheet. We've got a big book now. This is what we're doing. But no, the truth is, like, I might not have, like, I might change the entire fucking show on the way there. Like, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I did it with Mega Slam. We did, I, on the way there, I ripped it up, the whole thing would be written. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Well, that's tough. And then you have to go to the WWE guys, and the guys that are there, and go, that's the, well, you're not doing this, we're going to do this. And, yeah. and I got, I got good people around me, so they kind of. Is there some egos when you do that sometimes? You know, uh, it depends. I mean, the older guys ain't doing jobs. Yeah, you're not gonna, you know, just, nobody. I mean, a lot of guys like, I don't know what it is. They just they're not. But there are guys that want to get the younger talent over. Yeah, if they really like them, and, and um, some of those like New Jack's phenomenal to work with. And there's so many bad stories about New Jack. New Jack coming to SWF was like the greatest thing ever for me. Sam man, same way. Sam man will actually sit there and watch what these guys are doing. Um, Gene Snitsky, same way. Um, yeah. Adam Rosen was previously here, same way. Um, Balbina, same way. I mean, a lot of those guys, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, they'll just take the time to do it. And it's very rare because some guys just want the money and want to go home. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that's really become a big thing for SWF is that they bring in these stars and legends and and really... Snitsky, I feel like, has become like sort of a staple of SWF. Gene is awesome, Gene. I really didn't know what to do with him at first because he's so. He's Gene Snitsky. I mean, yeah. the guy is, is he had a great run and he's in better shape now than he was then. And then he met Leather. So he meets Giant Leather, and I'm like, well, there's something we can do here. He really liked Leather. And, and when Gene went out and did that, like, we. We decided he's kind of like, it's part of the roster. Like Gene's pretty much you know, mm-hmm. around every other show or every two shows, and he's part of the, the Netflix documentary. I mean, they were in his home with him, and you know uh, the other dogs movie. So they, they went out and talked to Gene for like eight hours mm-hmm. and worked out with him the whole deal. So he's part of the yeah, he's part of the Gene is definitely part of the team. And well, that's one of the things like when you get there early and you hear guys like Gene Stisky telling them, hey man. That's a guy who's been there, made money, went up there, had a great run, telling these guys, like, you know, nothing. It doesn't matter if there's 500 people, 200 people, nothing's entitled. That ring needs to be put up. You need to sweep the ring. You need to, you know, always keep your ego in check. That's where really the most value comes in with those guys. Yeah. So talking about um, egos and the locker room and big names, um, just talk about the type of dyna- dynamic with having Grimm's toy show there every every show. I love Grimm. I love Grimm, and it, it's a... Some guys don't. I mean, it's not a secret. They, they look at it like, well, Rob's prostituting out the... Uh, the <laughs> SWF have to bring Grimm in because uh, he just wants to bring guy, people into the show. It, it's not really the truth. Grimm, Grimm has a market that he caters to. Yeah. And that market is the YouTube market. So the general idea was... You know, if the SWF can give Grimm a segment and he can use that seven, six, seven minutes to propel his stuff, that'll bring stuff and does. And we try to intermingle and make it work. But 
Well, there's some real heat there. There's there's some guys that but, really don't like Grimm. Yeah, but yeah. I like Grimm. So you're not the only show to do it, though. I mean, like BBWF has done it. You know, uh, they? Uh, they yeah, were. Well, that, that, yeah, that's the one that stole everybody's t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. and they ran up to the Jersey Shore to run against us. One of the business. Those guys. Yeah. Yeah, I so I mean, but like other Mark shows. Mark Haggerty's cool though. So I got no issues with him. He's a cool guy. Yeah. He's a good dude. Oh, man. But like, yeah, I wasn't I mean, supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one icon, brother. Did you mind? <laughs> so let's talk about Mega Slam because that was a turning point for you. Management wow. kind of changed, right? Changed you, you, know, you 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 went, you know, you you changed directions. You know, you were, yeah. you know, um, putting more. You, know, you changed the whole concept of your prior shows in this one particular. It was the the starting point of a new era for you. Yeah, um, what encouraged the change? You know, in in presenting Mega Slam and, and going forward, twenty man, it's hard to believe it was almost a year ago. Twenty sixteen. If I go back to the year prior, mm-hmm. uh, I, I was you know, I don't think I was in the best state of mind. I was just doing things and stuck in my ways. And guy, I just wanted to change the product. And you know, so as that <clears throat> went on, I remember me having a meeting up in Jersey Shore. With guys there and saying, hey, you know, I go right, it was September. Mm-hmm. We, were, we were getting ready. This, this was September right before the last Mega Slam show, which was in January of this year. And I said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna run more shows and we're gonna change direction. And, and everybody looked at me like a praise it again. It just not the same. Thing. My mindset was we got still. Mm-hmm. Numbers were down. People weren't buying into it. Like, you know, like there's only it was just time to switch it up. Uh, there was a lot of management changes at the time, you know, it was, um, at the time we, yeah, I had, uh, I had one previous, uh, team working with me and I, I got rid of it all, every piece of it. I just started as a loan, started over writing. Um, guys like TJ Marconi coming in were, were great, still great assets to me. And, you know, those guys, uh, that really wanted, I felt like the guys that wanted to be here, there were other guys that were employed, Mm-hmm. Or independent contractors or on shows that, you know, I'm covering their bases because they're fucked up on whatever they're fucked up on. And, you know, now they're trashing me through social media, but I'm covering their bases because they're my friends. And I'm like, we could either run a business or just run a hobby. Mm-hmm. So what happened at that point was it's like, you know what, let's move forward. We got uh, right into October, November were really good shows. Um, some additions came in. Uh, then, I, then Chad Minnis came in at the time. Uh, Chad came in to work with me uh, after leaving, uh, I believe, uh, Wrestle Pro Music for a little bit. And me and Chad met and talked, and he wanted to come in and get involved. And, and we were able to, to connect for a little bit and do that. And the Mega Slam was coming to Jackson for a show to be in, in that area. Besides, for other companies are there, and they run a different style of death matches. But the, that Mega Slam show was like, okay, let's change and Chad was just very passionate about changing it with me and we did it and and that night was monumental mm-hmm. and it still held true because I mean we were in Jackson two weeks ago you know, we were just almost a little bit less of the crowd but it was there and, and now the product from what Mega Slam was to now is completely mm-hmm. it's off the charts I mean it's, it's a totally it's, 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 I, I believe it's even better I believe it gets better as we go along, so it, it's gonna. Be, that's what did it. It was just changing the mindset, man. Now, a lot of shows, you know, they open up the doors at six, right, and they don't get out until eleven. How do you keep people entertained? Well, you know, is that now, the challenge? We, we've tried to uh, short. I used to run when I first started running shows. They were gone forever. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I lock the door, nobody's leaving. <laughs> but then it was people get pissed and they're like, fuck this we're not coming back you know? but, I mean it's worth the money because you're but there I you get to like see the stars I mean I don't know what is the WWE ticket these days like, you bought a general oh, admission I think it's 20 they start at 25 oh yeah right. then, so, and then StubHub makes it I, 50 alright so, <laughs> so I haven't been to a, a WWE I haven't watched the product and, and the last thing I watched was the, uh, the Undertaker retirement thing and I watched the thing killed Sting um, yeah. that was all I watched um, but I look at it like we now it's like okay we'll do the VIP meet and greet six thirty. Mm-hmm. Then you know it's kind of like looking outside, and now what I'm noticing is there's lines around the, there's lines around the building. There's people there early. Like, 
It's the same people. Yeah. Town to town, they're driving two hours, and it's just fucking cool. Like, like, you know, and then it's like, you know, going out. And, I think that's what it is. I think it's cause people come out, they know, like, you know, I'll come out and hang out with you, okay. which most people won't do. Like, you know, they'll have that first name basis with me, and then. But the entertainment factor, keeping them entertained, is I try, we're trying to end the shows at like 10 now. Yeah. So we'll start with, like, let's say, the bell time's 8. Okay. That usually means 8.05. Yeah. Or somebody will run to, to find me and go, it's getting close, and I'll yell, like, no, wait, this person. And I'll, if I know, let's say, eight people, if I just know there's eight people that are in traffic, mm-hmm. and they'll go send a message out on Facebook or thing, I'm like, fuck it, we can't start. These people are on their way, they're in traffic. They have to see them, they, they just have to be here for the beginning. Mm-hmm. I don't care if it's eight people, or if it's one, it's just the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. But now it's the entertainment factor, because there's always something that happens at the end of an SWF show now. That leads to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Like me getting hit the head with something or different things or variations. And, and then there's like these little, in certain buildings, like we'll just completely go off script on everything where you have, okay, the show's over, but no, it's really not. Now we're just going to hang out and take pictures in the ring with the people. Mm-hmm. And then K-Fave's completely gone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. It's, yeah. It's definitely different. So with the um with uh, underdogs and that partnership that you got going on, uh, coming out on Netflix, um, can you kind of tell us like how that got started and you know how you guys came up with the whole project together? Well, underdogs right now is in Atlanta, which is upsetting me. I don't know if they're <laughs> listen to this, and they're gonna get mad at me for saying this. But, but uh, it it was out of nowhere. I'm gonna to be we'll just take a sip of water, I'm blown up. <laughs> <laughs> Other dogs, um, <coughs> excuse me, other dogs came out of nowhere. Yeah. And the way that happened was, um, the truth was, we had run, I believe, 24 shows at that point this year. And I was burnt. And this was about May. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do four more. You know, we're right towards Mega Slam and run Mega Slam. And that's it. Then Billy, who's my vice president of the company, I'm Cletus with the company, uh, you know, gives me a call and says, look, these people want to talk to you. Who? And I'm blowing it off. I'm like, man, this is, come on, man. Look all these people, like, they work for visual media, they want to talk to you, they want to film, they want to document on wrestling. And I'm blowing it off. Three, four times blow it off. Missed the first two meetings, knock out. Yeah, I'll be there to show up. Finally, I call back and it's like, all right. So they, they initially, I I believe, talked with, um, I think it was, they were looking at a couple of companies, but they couldn't get the access they wanted. Mm-hmm. And uh, I finally had agreed to meet with them. Not like I didn't, I didn't actually believe it would even, I didn't even know Netflix was a possibility or any of that. I just figured I'll talk to them. Maybe it'll be cool to have some cameras there and we'll, we'll get some footage out of it and whatever. But no, it was, the meeting went great, and it was just, hey, we want to film wrestling, and they knew nothing about this world, they knew about, you know, filming different things, and other movies and stuff, and when they came to the first show, and they meet New Jack, and they see New Jack stabbing, you know, two of the green horns in the head with four, you know, and then, you know, they're hearing, like, hey, man, I had back surgery in 2010, I was paralyzed for two days, they're in my house for eight hours, they're talking to my doctors, they're meeting with these legends. They became fans of wrestling. Mm. So it just became those four shows I wanted to do right out the fucking window. Those four became, okay, now we're going to add 16. Yeah. So it's like, now we're going to keep going. And that's what it was. We just started adding shows because they needed more content to film. And it's just, it's rolling. And it's been creatively challenging. Yeah. I mean, forget it. I mean, one of the things that just took place and it'll be on it was, um, was uh, the uh, the kid Christian injury? Yeah, yeah, that happened and uh, really scary. See, you know, we did, did Barney get uh, two weeks October fourteenth, two weeks ago. Yeah. Know, blew his shoulder out in that match with Sebastian Cage. Had a great match. And it was just on a regular bump, nothing crazy. Just you know, he's had that injury and he doesn't listen. I'm like, throw take some time off his heel. Yeah. It's nuts. He's like I will, <laughs> but I'm sitting there in that ring with him. You know, that, that's his first time I stop a live show. Hey, this is a really serious situation, and they're they're filming it. 
Mm-hmm. And I hear like the, some of the people were upset that they were filming, and they had the, the, the cameras in their face, and like they were like, the fans were upset, people at the show were upset. I was upset at first, That's and then true. I chilled out with it. And then, mm-hmm. But that was a real, real thing. And like, there's so much on this documentary that is, I think people are gonna look at the whole industry and just go, you know, this is totally, it's very real. They have access to like, they were in my house, they were in Gene Stitsky's house, they, they've been everywhere. They're town to town, show to show. And, and, you know, it, it's gonna be really cool when it's released. Like, I just, uh, but I never thought it would ever, you know, materialize into becoming something that's its own brand. And, you know, it's cool to be an executive, whatever, whatever the hell I am, a producer or <laughs> something on it. But uh, whatever I am on it, it's cool. So I'm happy about it. You mentioned Crit Christian. Yeah. Um, so he's he's one of the guys you've had on for a while. They're getting who, for this one. <laughs> who are some of the young guys that are up and coming that you could, you know, that you think are going to become mega stars and that you had, you know? You had Leo Rush there. Leo, you, know. you know what, Leo, he's, he's got some shit going yeah. on. Right? right? Yeah. yeah. So. Well, I'll give you my opinion on him in a minute. I will. <laughs> yeah. And some people might like it, they might not. But, um, Kid Christian, and, and if he could stay healthy, mm-hmm. it's a muscle man, Ron. Yeah. Save his bumps for the right time and, and, and pick his moments, keep his head straight. He's got all the potential in the world. And, and the kid uh, was trained at, uh, I think, WrestlePro mm-hmm. initially. And uh, I don't know what happened over there, but it didn't work out. And I remember him calling me and going, I want to go to work. And I looked back and I believed in him. I just, I knew it from day one. Like, as soon as I saw him, I said, we just going to get better. Um, definitely him. Jordan Oliver. Yeah, that's came one. Out, if I Jordan came out of nowhere. Jordan was the kid's friend. And he said, this kid wants to work. I said, dude, he's phenomenal. Who is this? This kid looks like a I don't even know what he is. Like, what is this? Like, he's sending me pictures of this kid. I'm like, bro, I don't, I don't know what this kid looks. I don't, I don't want nothing to do with this. Please, 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 Rob. He bothered me for six months. Fine, we'll do it. He goes, who's he wrestling? I said, I'll work him. I'll. He's gonna work me. So I, I wrestled Jordan Oliver in his first match. They before I had a six car collision at the Garden State Parkway. So it wasn't much of a match. It was just more of to see, you know, like I had a concussion going into it. Like, well, if he doesn't kill me or, 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 or stick me or kick me in my head, maybe we can do something. With it. I just wanted to see if he would listen out there. That's all it really was. Like, mm-hmm. If he could listen and then protect me and protect himself, but he can just listen. And that was about two years ago. So I look at him, he's got all the talent in the world. I mm-hmm. don't like his new hair that's blonde. <laughs> I, I like it. I, I think he looks like Ellen DeGeneres now. He looks like fucking Big Bird. <laughs> I know he's going to hear this. I haven't seen you know, He but looks he, like Big Bird, but he another one with all the talent in the world. Yeah, I see awesome. those two guys. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, a guy that's never worked here yet, Mike Orlando. I think Orlando yeah, a lot of, of course. Yeah, of course. I love Mike. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to bring Mike in yet. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, as far as what what else is new and out there, uh, a lot of guys. I, I like some of the guys at UWA. I think mm-hmm. they got a lot of talent. Um, but I think that there's a resurgence of the veteran talent too that mm-hmm. we're seeing like now. Like it's like you still have, you know, it's not really just me. It's like you still got guys like like Steve Mack out there, Danny Moff out there. Going out there, killing it every weekend. Yeah, like it was true. twenty years ago, man. Um, you know, Arcadia, Kyle the Beast, phenomenal. Kyle gets better every single time. Yeah. I see him work. Um, you know, there's a lot of talent. There's a plethora of talent out there. There's more talent probably that I haven't even looked at yet. I, I get, you know, I started in the business. We had a beeper in ninety seven, mm-hmm. ninety eight. I had a beeper. Like, yeah. If you impress the promoter and somebody put a word in, you got a beep, and there you were <laughs> on the next show. <laughs> now it's just resumes of things. Really? I just get resumes. I can't be, like, dude. This is not a job application. Yeah. Send me a YouTube clip. Yeah. Well, just call me. It's just, uh, it's like it's insanity. Like resume, twenty eight <laughs> seminars. <laughs> I trained with Jerry Lynn. I'm like, well, Jerry Lynn, the mechanic on the corner of Jerry Lynn. It's like all these crazy things. But, um, I think Waylon Cage, another guy that I, 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 I'll take credit for because I trained him. Waylon was taught the basics. James was like, well, James was like, 
Let's give you the name of it. Right? James Dudunsky. All right. He, he was uh, another one that broke my balls for six months. Came to every SWF show in the Jersey Shore. How do I be a wrestler? You don't want to be a wrestler. How do I be a wrestler? You don't want to do, dude, you can wake up with pain every day. I want to be a wrestler. One night, I said, give me your number. I call him at two in the morning one day. <laughs> <laughs> Picks up. I, I don't even say who I am. I said, who's your favorite wrestler? It was Rob. I said, who's your favorite wrestler? He's on Anderson. Just blew my fucking mind. I'm like, on Anderson. Yeah. Like, I just like, yeah, man, greatest spine buster ever. Yeah. And, and that guy, like, just, okay. I worked with him. Just basic stuff, taught him basic stuff. Everything else, every seminar we did, every training opportunity, just picked it up on the fly. I think people have the talent. If they just want to pursue it, they can do it. That's what it really is. That's how I feel. That's awesome. Nice. So, like, when you, when you book a show, like, what are you looking for when you're, when you're putting together an SWF show? Um, it depends what version of the show, because there's usually about 10 of them. Yeah. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, we have November 17th, Parliament, New Jersey. November 18th, <laughs> Volunteer Community Center, Berkeley Little League. So, you know, I know coming into Parliament, we're in a very saturated area of wrestling. So when I book a show, it's it's really going to be by the area, mm-hmm. what the building's going to allow you to get away with. You know, can we bleed? Can we curse? Can we be a little bit edgy? Are we family friendly? Well, for me, it's now it's, you know, putting together basically point A to point to the end point and basically say, okay, where are we going creatively? Because if the, if the end point is mega slam, that end point is really the start point for the new year. Mm-hmm. So now it's kind of what I'm doing is we're booking backwards. Mm-hmm. It's an old school WWF thing that they would do. Like, you know, so when I, when I talk with those guys, I'll have a bunch of ideas and maybe, you know, 70%. At the end of the day, it'll all be my, my, my final call, but. I'll get hit up with a bunch of ideas. What I'm looking for, though, is is edgy. There's some comedy. You know, there's a little bit of hardcore. There's a little bit of, you know, the, the legends, the ECW guys, you know, uh, some rarities that you won't see. Um, it's it's really hitting every demographic. I want the... Initially, the vision for SW of wrestling was I wanted it to be like... I had this idea in my mind of like this, this giant coliseum where, you know, everyone from everywhere can come to work and have these exhibition matches. But I could never do that because nobody ever wanted to get along, mm-hmm. and it could never happen. So the other idea was, let's hit everything. Let's hit everything. So if you're an ECW fan, you could see the Sandman or, or me, Jack, or Tommy Dreamer. Or if you're a WWE Attitude Era guy, you can see this. Or, you know, If you're just an indie guy, you could see the guys that you might, you know, like Leo Rushes or when he was around and these type of things and then the future of the industry then mix it up with some of the guys from a different generation like Magic Me um, Steve Mack you know and guys that are part of like the future like TJ Marconi who's the best big man in the business no doubt about it and that's yeah. how I feel it's like an all star kind of roster yeah. yeah I think now we're better than ever and Anthony Gagone can't say enough about him yeah he's amazing King of New York one of the best heels out there and I'll tell you a funny story that he's going to snap right there. <laughs> this is not a PG story. Oh so we're in Toto in New, we're in Toto in New Jersey. Um, this is uh, September. And TJ's running late with Sean Maluda and all those boys up from New York because they got a double shot. And I'm in a fucking panic because we got two matches left for the main, which was Chenzo and TJ for the title. So I go over to the King of New York, and then they're used to dealing with, I mean, I'm still one of the boys. It's different where I'm not like, you know, fucking super promoted dickhead guy. Like, I'm still, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, like, you know, I'm, I'm still in the sense where it's like, I'm not, you know, I'm still actively wrestling. As, as insane as that is at 38 now with two back surgeries, I'm still out there. When I want to work, I want to work. So it's like, I go over to the King of New York, and I'm like, bro, we got a stall. So what's up? Like, they're not here. TJ's not here. He told me he'd be here 15 minutes ago. That was an hour ago. No, oh, man. So he goes, what do you want me to do? Now, if there's kids listening to this whole thing, like, parents move away. <laughs> I says, dude, I don't care if you have to go out there and pull your cock out for 10 minutes. <laughs> just be a fucking heel. And he just looks at me and smiles and says nothing. 
I don't even know what his thoughts are right now, but but that's legitimately what happened because that's what I had to say because I had no, I had no answers. But he went out there, did a ten minute promo, and everything worked out. And the show ended by ten twenty. Nice. Wow. wow, nice. <laughs> and he didn't do anything obscene either. So, uh, so everything worked out perfectly. <laughs> um, this is it. Kid Christian, when he came on, he told us the story about how he came over to SWI. I got it. So you got to send me a link to that. I didn't hear, I didn't hear that interview. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He's, he's cool. He's cool guy. But, what um, did he say? I'm curious. <laughs> I'm I was just gonna, yelling. What I didn't just, he say? Well, just, <laughs> I got all the shirts in my car because I got hurt. He had nobody to take them. Oh, oh, really? I'm sale for five dollars. That's fine. I, uh, I was just going to ask you, what is your relationship like with Dan Ma? With who? Dan Ma. Ma, uh, I haven't talked to Ma for a while. Um, I, I think he's, um, Ma is, is, is still one of the best in the game. Yeah, I haven't talked true. to Dan in about probably a year and a half. I don't think we've seen each other and talk. I talk to Steve sometimes, but um, always was a good relationship. I mean, he, he has worked for SWF. And it was a very big part of WrestlePro's operation. They're doing great things over there. Um, but Dan believed in Kid Christian before anybody did. Yeah. Like, and that, like, when like when you get that stamp, yeah. you know, and that guy says, hey, you know, Fury, do the right thing. Like, well, let's get this. And that was the whole thing. Like, coming from that, because th- that generation of guys that broke in that that area was like Homicide, Moff, you know, low key, low key were like Blue Rainbows. Like, those guys all came up, and it was cool because they would all sit in one corner. We'd be, I'd be on the same shows as them. I didn't realize that they were all even King of New York. Like I didn't realize I knew him for twenty years. Well, that's why I saw like, dude, like, yeah, yeah. So like, Moff, I haven't seen him in a, in a while. I've seen some of his work. I've seen a lot of what he's done recently. Yeah. I love the Hit Squad. I'm a huge fan of them. I I, I can't, you know, prove, I think they get better with time. Oh, that's the and, truth. Um, but uh, they're, he's killing it, man. They're, they're still killing it. And, and But he was legitimately the first guy, I believe. You know, and even with Pat Buck, I haven't talked to Pat Buck in two years. This is a strange relationship. But I don't hate the guy. Yeah. I think he's successful. Uh, I, I admire his success. But I think, like, when they they saw that talent in the kid, and, you know, SWF, thank God, was able to capitalize and give the kid his first real break and shot. He's, you know, hopefully he just... Feels up and does well. But the relation with Mob, I haven't talked to him. I hope he's doing great. Yeah. It looks like he's doing great. Yeah, I just saw him this past weekend. He's amazing. Yeah. Him and Monster what, Mac. What are they? Beyond. Oh, they, that was yeah, the Hate Club. Oh, my God. They, they're amazing. Those guys. Dude, they're just. They just get, like you said, they just get better. And, uh, you know. Like, like I, I, see, I saw the pictures that um that Steve put up. Yeah. And I just, just man, like, yeah. It's like that Smurf Blue and stuff like that. I mean, they're, 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 they're as real as it gets. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that's the, the cool <clears throat> thing. Like, and, um, I think that's great, like, to have guys like, even with like, Mac and a lot. And I wish Mop was, was part of SWF in, in a way. And, and I always say, never say never, you know, because mm-hmm. anything can happen. If everything is in the right place. But, uh, I, I really, uh, I always enjoyed their work. Yeah. And they, that's like that's how it is. Like we just said, they get better in time. How was that? Oh, it was awesome. That was my first Beyond show, and I mean they weren't the main event. I mean no no disrespect to Joey Janela and Michael Elgin, but I mean that that was awesome. And th- those guys at the end of the night too, uh, you know they they put on a hell of a show. And then I I stayed for CCW, which was a long night, but I mean the whole day was just like a dream come true. Oh, just that, 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 uh, I mean I. I think I looked at like eleven thirty, but I mean my day started like get two there. And well, all those guys are super <laughs> talented. Yeah, yeah. Janelle is like it's awesome, fucking insane. Yeah. 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 Joey is is I always Joey. He just, has the it factor for sure. He has. He is great, just phenomenal. And I, I had we did we did him, Kid and Jordan. Yeah, you know, triple threat. And I, I was like, it was just the wrong town to do it. That, that's we just picked the wrong time to do the match mm-hmm. in, but mm-hmm. it was fucking like they just he's great, Joey's great. Um, they were all really great. Everybody just matched, it was phenomenal. I never get to go out to shows, that's mm-hmm. the part. I never get to go out anywhere to go to these shows, so it's like I'll just kind of see clips. <laughs> yeah. When, um, when did you, did you start with the uh, kind of like the unbreakable gimmick? I would say because I, it's, it's kind of like it's, I mean, it's, it's perfect for you. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you're, you're obviously unbreakable. 
And um, kind of like going back to earlier, it's like there's always like people, they always got something to say about Rob, whether it's negative or positive. And it's like you always like just stay positive all the time. Like I always see you on Facebook or whatever. And you never, I've never seen you you ever say anything negative about anybody and people just always talk bad about you sometimes, you know? I try to, uh, I don't want to snap. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try to be cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Because I know a lot, I read it and I'm going to tell you the unbreakable thing, but when I read the stuff that's said, it, it's just false. So like for me to react to stuff that's not yeah. real, it's like, eh, I'm not going to react to but if they attack the fan base like they did recently, mm-hmm. if they attack, you know, they attack the kid that was sick. Then I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Or if they attack, you know, the Ross, or they, or it's like something that's just blatantly that could hurt the business or hurt, you know, what we're doing with fundraisers. Then I will, I might prep my message privately or, or mm-hmm. something like that. But most of it's coming from just people that aren't here anymore. Yeah, and uh, other promotions that just don't like me. And but the unbreakable thing was. Uh, it was insanity. I mean, because uh, I, in 2009, I had taken a little break from the business. I wanted to, you know, live a normal life and just get away. And I uh, fell in a 20 foot manhole. In, oh, man. In, in wow. Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. That's my mantra. <laughs> so, you know, the, the restaurant Wheelers, man. I went to Wheelers and um, I fell in a 20 foot manhole. I broke my back. Wow. And uh, I waited to have surgery. I didn't want to do it until I couldn't get my right leg more than five inches off the floor. So that whole thing was like, you know, wrestling was never even in my mind at that point. I was just managing banks, you know, nothing to didn't even think about. I didn't watch the product. I was mm-hmm. disassociated with it. So um, I had surgery, and then I started to get this itch about, at the right around that time, the wrestler came out. So I watched that movie, and I'm like, then I had a bad relationship break up and all these weird things just happened. I got laid off from Wells Fargo at the time. I'm like, well, I'm not gonna go to, I'm gonna go to an indie show and just kinda check out a show. And Tommy the Moose, God bless him, saved my life. And I was in a bad state of mind. I went to an indie show, walked in at heat within the first two minutes because, you know, I didn't sell to certain people and everybody hated me. And he says, Hey, there's a show tomorrow, do you wanna work? Just, dude, I don't know what'll happen if I land on my back because I said surgery, you know, and I got my lower back to steel in there now, and and uh, that was it. So I went to the doctor about a year later after working, coming back in and working. I was just doing Rob Fury at the time, and did you know, did the makeup things. I figured the gimmick would be a throwback. And the doctor said, after looking at MRIs, you know, as years went by, he basically says, you know, well, you can't. He goes, there's no man in the world that's unbreakable. If you, if you land on your back like this, you, eventually something's going to, you're going to snap something, you're not going to be able to fix something. Yeah. I said, all right, cool. That was my, my, my <laughs> mindset. I, I get epidural injections and nerve block injections and all these things done roughly. You know, I've had 901 injections in nine years now mm-hmm. that I've returned to rest, to actively wrestling. But when he said that, two days later, you know, my tattoo artist had the word unbreakable tattooed on my back, and I was it. It was the unbreakable Rob Fury. And then I just looked at it like life. I just, you know, some people were like, well, you can't break anything else. That's why you're unbreakable. <laughs> <laughs> you broken everything. But, um, yeah, that's what it came from. What inspired the face paint? The, uh, it was at the time, well, I was going through a really bad breakup, man. Mm-hmm. Well, to be honest, I had an ex that just decided to just like screw around, and I couldn't really. I couldn't sell. Like, I was working, I couldn't... A lot of the selling is facial expressions. Mm-hmm. And I remember somebody that said, hey, man, you're not really selling correctly like you used to. I was like, all right, well, I can fix that. Mm-hmm. So then I just put the, the paint on. You know, I'd hide, you know... Well, sometimes it looks like shit if I'm in a rush, but <laughs> if, it's, if I'm not and I have time, it'll look better. But <clears throat> but what inspired it really was um, that. At the time, I really was not in the best state of mind. Mm-hmm. But then when, like, you know, I started with the boot tassels and, you know, the A's promos and all that <laughs> stuff, I was like, wait a minute, this is, I'm just going to be a combination of everything. So that's what it was. It's like, you know, let's do a throwback. And and, and I, I, like, I like the kids like it. Like, when you got there, it looks different. A lot of people, Kyle LeBeast does a version of his own. Mm-hmm. A lot of, some of the, very few indie guys are doing it because they feel like it's outdated. To me, it's a throwback. It's, you know, you have to have something like that today. I love when Arcadia and TJ did the face paint too. That was awesome. They have three of them. <laughs> the, uh, 
the arcade at TJ Beast. They did the, uh, the black and white. Yeah, it was pretty cool that night. So you gave five guys a chance, you know. Um, and Tommy, you know, is a close friend of yours, right? Very you know, how does it feel knowing that he's on the opposite side, you know, when he was at five guys? And, you know, um, it, was a, it was a lot of <laughs> five guys, you know. They're taking over. I mean, the, there's. The, the, the whole thing with them was that it was the, the one thing we didn't write. Mm-hmm. And that's why it worked. And I, it was like, you know, they want, they basically said, we're going to screw Rob. <laughs> that's what they did. Like, one guy didn't show up. It was a show we were doing. Mm-hmm. And the, I forgot what the finish was supposed to be in the match we were doing. And Tommy decided they were going to change it all. <laughs> <laughs> so they turned this, this, it wound up being a handicap match, but he turned on, on somebody and then threw up a big five set. The next time I know it's, I got, I got a five guys group. I'm like, what is this? Wow. They, it was a rib on me. Yeah. Wow. I was pissed. I was jelly. Like, you can't do this. You, you, you know, <laughs> this is what the fuck. I come out, we can't rewrite this now. <laughs> you know, then like, you know.
He's quit the company more times than anyone. <laughs> Tommy the Moose, he's, he's wrestling Al Snow in the uh, next, next, uh, next two weeks from now. Thanks. So when, you know, the people think you're nuts when you when you work with other promotions like CCW, you know, you bring in Tommy Dreamer from House of Hardcore, you know, like, do you think do the guys in the back think like, oh, well, we're just giving a rub to these guys, you know, um, you know, when you bring in, uh, you know, some of these promoters slash wrestlers still. No, it, it, it's... You know, I've worked with a lot of the. I'm trying to think who we haven't worked with. I mean, uh, I think everybody hates me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the majority of the people out there don't like me, and 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 it's I'm not as volatile as I was. I'm kind of open to, to doing different things now with companies, um, but I don't have any any ill feelings towards any company. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you know, there's I mean. Pat Buck has wrestled for SWF. Yeah. Uh, Danny DeMonto has wrestled for SWF. DJ Hyde has wrestled for SWF. Preacher with uh, the mm-hmm. new standalone wrestling has wrestled for SWF. Um, and I know him 10 years. I mean, so I'm trying to think, well, it's Dreamer. Yeah. You know, he's.
You have just listened to the Wrestling IQ 101 podcast, powered by B Plus Player Radio.